In place of the published edition, tonight's programme is a report by Martin Bashir, postponed earlier, on satanic abuse. Because of the nature of the subject, you may find some scenes disturbing. According to some social workers and police officers, satanic abuse is spreading across Britain. Adults and children claim to have participated in bizarre rituals involving torture, cannibalism and culminating in the murder of hundreds of children every year. Tonight, Panorama investigates these allegations and asks, are crimes being committed in the name of Satan? Sometimes these rituals involve only a small number of people, 10 or 20. Then at, at other times it could involve hundreds. These images represent allegations of a bizarre and relatively new form of child abuse. It differs radically from cases of the past. Victims claim the perpetrators are not paedophiles, but practicing Satanists. This woman is undergoing therapy and says if we reveal her identity, she'll be murdered. They uh, use a lot of blood from animals and from humans, which would be from either an animal sacrifice or a human sacrifice. I am scared and I fear for my life. There's a lot of people out there trying to get out. No matter what level you're in at, it's, it's hard to come out of a group. Those treating so-called adult survivors say satanic abuse is a highly organised criminal conspiracy. The kind of criminal activity is buggery, uh, intimidation, uh, severe blackmail, um, child slavery. There's so many kinds of criminal activities within the system. And because of the criminal acts, it creates such a problem when somebody's trying to get out. What's the most extreme criminal act that takes place in some of these rituals? A murder is, as I understand it, from survivors. Similar stories have arisen across the country. In Lancashire, tales of the unexpected found their way to the home of MP Geoffrey Dickens. Before you mentioned to me a tunnel, what happened there? I just remember um, a tunnel to my left and all cloaks and everything to the right. He says satanic abuse is now a nationwide problem and is pursuing a campaign at Westminster. Control over children's minds and bodies. Oh, yes, Did you? I've been back to um, one of the tunnels since and I've seen uh, um, actually inside the tunnel a drawing of a pentagram yes. and alongside... I don't want to go over the top on this issue and frighten parents and frighten people, but it is quite widespread. All I know is that if these sort of cases have come to my attention and they're all in different parts of the United Kingdom, then the probability is that it is going on in most major towns and certainly the cities in this country. The incredible stories told It was in America that stories about satanic abuse first emerged during the 1980s. Videos were exported to child protection agencies in Britain. Soon, some social workers began searching for satanic abuse here. But for all the graphic images, there hasn't been one successful prosecution to date. Parents say their children have been wrongly taken away and traumatized by the very childcare system designed to protect them. The children and myself caught up in this system have been abused and physically abused, which is unforgivable. 
It should never have happened. And it's got to stop here now. There are children who are trying and trying to say, nobody touched us. It didn't happen. I'm all right. I'm safe with my father. I'm safe with my mother. I want to be back with my family. And they are not being listened to. Over the past four years, allegations of satanic abuse have surfaced across Britain, from the south coast up to the Orkney Islands. Child protection agencies have been quickly mobilised, taking children from their homes and spending substantial sums of money in the search for evidence. In Britain, this search is relatively new, but in the United States, it's been going on for almost a decade. On the eve of Halloween, a small town in Georgia was struck by a satanic panic. Stories of 50,000 human sacrifices a year in the States have created a climate of fear. Since 1985, there have been over 50 similar panics. Uh, is your information reliable? Yes, it's real good information. Get busy with that, and I'll see if I can get up for some extra help. 321 to Taylor Ford, 1019 to this, so please. The police were quickly mobilized. Members of the public were told to lock up their children. By the morning, the panic had reached its peak. Mary Hortman sped off to school to rescue her child. Someone told me that a group of these devil worshippers was coming into town to, to get a blonde-haired, blue-eyed girl to sacrifice the body. So I went to, or automatically went to school to get my daughter because she has blonde hair and blue eyes. Children were rushed onto several buses, a convoy returning them home to safety. Despite investigation, the police found no evidence, but they still believe Satanists are in town. We know that devil worshippers exist. We find uh, proof of them as being around. Uh, we haven't run across any devil worshippers, but we know they exist. Belief in satanic abuse has been promoted by some sections of the church. Fundamentalist Christians, with their literal understanding of the Bible, have always nurtured a doctrine of the devil. During the 1980s, some Christians involved in child protection began speaking about a new form of child abuse, perpetrated by Satanists. From here, the dogma spread to social workers and police officers across the United States. What's actually going on here? Uh, this is a survivor uh, named Aaron. Christian police officer Randy Eamon felt ideally placed to uncover the facts behind satanic abuse. At first, he believed survivors and helped produce a video warning of the dangers. When we initially put the video together, uh, my role was more or less an advisor. After a thorough search, he found no evidence. Having a, a Christian background, um, naturally you have an interest in the evil one. But I would intentionally push away my Christian beliefs and say, wait a minute, I'm a policeman. As far as I'm concerned, a crime is a crime, and we need to investigate it. One of the things you have to remember is, I trained myself to look for this. I believed it, and I wanted to find it. I looked so hard. It's not there. The evidence isn't there. I do. You do? Yes. Hello, you. Hi. Most adult survivors make allegations during therapy sessions like this one. No, right. <laughs> That's true. Well, can you tell me anything about this pain that was right there behind the eye? She is remembering some things that happened. Therapists help clients regress to childhood to uncover repressed memories. Survivors say Satanists are highly skilled at concealing evidence. Either uh, the evidence uh, is eaten um, through cannibalistic sorts of aspects of, of the ceremonies. Particular body parts are more favored than others in, in different sects. Um, and uh, often the uh, groups are connected with mortuaries and uh, 
so the rest of it is burned. Um, and at at the higher levels, the higher cult levels, um, the the cleanup is very sophisticated. And and there is no evidence. Actions open. Come to position one. The FBI has targeted over 2,000 cases of satanic abuse. With modern detection techniques, concealing evidence is almost impossible. It's not as easy as these people think to get rid of a human body. No matter how much the average person cleans it up, there are going to be traces left behind. So in these cases, it's not only a matter of no bodies, but no evidence that these murders take place. The interviews you're about to hear express the most heinous activities of Satan at work in the earth today. The conspicuous lack of evidence has led some to focus more closely on the accounts of survivors. I've just got one answer, and I have absolutely no other answer as to the Lord Jesus. Lauren Stratford, a fundamentalist Christian, is now a celebrity on the chat show circuit. Following publication of her autobiography, Satan's Underground, she became America's best-known survivor. In the book, she describes how she was born illegitimately and adopted at birth. She was then subjected to brutal physical abuse by her mother. By the age of six, she was raped in the basement by a laborer. The rapes continued with her mother's support, and by the age of eight, she was starring in child pornography and involved in perverted sex with animals. She ran away from home aged 20, and it was then that she met the satanic ringleader, Victor. Within months, she was initiated into the satanic cult. In the book, which became an American bestseller, she describes her role in the satanic rituals. Ceremonies included the drinking of blood and culminated in the sexual abuse of children. Years later, Stratford underwent therapy. In the process, she recalled how Victor asked her to participate in the murder of a newborn baby, the purest sacrifice, he said, to Satan. Then she realized how she herself gave birth to three children. The first two were allegedly killed in pornographic films, and the third, a son she calls Joey, murdered in a satanic ritual. Joey's body was laid on a black robe. The coven members each held his candle to the edge of the robe. He was quickly engulfed in flames. Joey was no more. As the flames began to consume the sacrifice, I yelled, Satan, you didn't get Joey. Joey went to be with Jesus. He fooled you all. The number one thing that I wanted to do in writing the book was to say, look, here's what I went through. I'm willing to just stand naked in front of you, as it were, to let you know that there's somebody else who's gone through what you've gone through. Do you still stand by the contents of that book? Yes, I do. We tracked down Lauren Stratford's sister, Willow, to verify the contents of the book. But she denies any knowledge of abuse within the family and says Lauren never gave birth to even one child. Her sister, who's a Christian missionary, says Lauren is deliberately deceiving the church to make money. I think that there are other ways to earn a living and there are other ways to be real. I think it takes away from the gospel of Jesus Christ and the gospel of Jesus Christ is to help the poor and the hungry and uh, not make up stories and, and do this. So I think she's hurting the very people that supposedly believe her. Others in the church are now equally skeptical about Lauren Stratford's story. Gretchen Passantino and her husband Bob are Christian journalists. They decided to scrutinize Lauren Stratford's book to see if there was any basis to the story. They dismissed the account of her childhood and found no evidence for her alleged pregnancies. She was pregnant three times and carried three babies to full term, and yet no one she knew at the time was aware that she was even pregnant. That's a little incredible, especially after our article came out and when uh, her publisher, Harvest House Publishers, was asked, can she just give us the name of even one person who would have known that she was pregnant, even one of those times? We could even track them down. It's not that hard to find people. It's been impossible to find anybody who can verify that you were pregnant 
on any of the three occasions that you describe. Yes, I'll agree with that. I don't I mean I don't know. I so just have to take whatever. Were you telling the truth about that incident? Yes, I was. Yet, you're not able to substantiate the fact that you were pregnant three times. The first two times, I can't really tell you a lot about yet. Um, Do you understand the problem that people would oh, have with course, that? Oh, of course, of uh, course. I, if I were in your shoes right now, I would say, gosh. It sure sounds silly to me. I don't think I believe it. I put it to you that you're not telling the truth. Well, I don't know what to say to you. You could admit you weren't. That wouldn't be the truth. But as yet, there's no evidence. There isn't an evidence for a lot of these cases. But your sister has said that she lived with you throughout that period. She doesn't recall anything like what you've described. That may be true and that may not be true. Despite the unreliability of survivor accounts, allegations continue to surface. They were beaten. They were stuck, cut. There's now a multi-million dollar industry producing videos, publishing books, promoting belief in satanic abuse. Constant, absolute terror, and I can't explain. But with no proof, the spotlight has now turned on how these allegations arise in the first place. Miami, South Florida, scene of one of the biggest cases of satanic abuse. Allegations centered around a church preschool in the south of the city. Satanic rituals allegedly took place in a nearby wood. Seven-year-old Ryan Phillips suffered from insomnia and was placed in therapy. He began to describe satanic rituals. Within weeks, 23 other children made similar statements. One little boy said that there was a lady that they cut open and they took a baby out and then they I guess they killed the baby. I don't know, they said that there was blood everywhere. We heard stories all the time of little animals being killed. Um, Ryan talked about Ryan described a, a, a kitten being held, and he said that he, he held the kitten's neck, and, he sh and Ryan, when he described it, shook his hands like that. During disclosure interviews, it emerged the abuser was a school assistant called Bobby. He was arrested and charged. Panorama has obtained recordings of the interviews which led to his arrest. They reveal a series of errors. In the exchange you're about to hear, a social worker is asking a five-year-old child about a picture of a clock. Up until this point, none of the children have mentioned sexual abuse or satanic rituals. What follows are a series of leading questions where the social worker is dictating the shape and content of the entire interview. Did he show you a picture of a baby also? Uh, yeah. He showed you a picture of a baby also. And what was wrong with the baby? It had black eyes. Red eyes. Okay, it had red eyes. No, pink eyes. Red eyes, pink eyes. It had eyes that were kind of a bright color. Yeah. And was the baby alive or was the baby dead, the one that Bobby showed you the picture of? Um, dead. The baby was dead? Okay. That's very sad, isn't it? In the space of just 25 seconds, the child has been led by the questioning from discussing a picture of a clock to one portraying a baby. The social worker then asks if there's something wrong with the baby. When the child doesn't respond, she then asks a blatantly leading question. Was the baby alive or dead? The child has only two options, and when she agrees the baby was dead, the therapist suggests she's given the correct answer by saying, that's very sad, isn't it? If your sole source of knowledge... The court's expert witness was Professor Stephen Cece. You'd be extremely confused. He showed how leading questions had directly shaped the allegations. He says investigators made the mistake of focusing on just the final interviews. 
Are children lying? What are the factors that influence the credibility of their reports? The problem is, is they're focusing on the final interview, the final bit of testimony the child gave the social worker or the courts. If they actually looked at the process as it unfolded over many months, often over even years, they see a far different story. They see uh, the seeds of suggestion building on itself over many, for example, therapy sessions or child protective service interviews so that the final result doesn't bear much resemblance to what happened in the middle and no resemblance at all to what happened at the beginning of the process. A few days later, the same child undergoes another therapy session. Again, the subject, a baby. But this time, the social worker leads the child from a mere picture to a live infant. Then, using two dolls, one representing the perpetrator, the other the victim, the child is invited to act out the alleged abuse. Do you remember, Dominique, right? you told me that Bobby showed you a picture of a baby? Yes. Or it was a real baby? Okay, was the baby really there in front of you? Was the baby moving? Yes. Okay. Can you show me with this Bobby doll what he did to that baby? I was thinking with the mouth. You want to get the wooden spoon and spank him? It looks like you're stabbing him. You're stabbing him? Uh-oh. Would you please get the doctor's thing up so we can hurt him? You want to hurt him? You want to hurt this Bobby doll because of what he did to you? Yes. The therapist encourages the child to dress the former doll as a witch or as a devil by putting a cape on it, by putting horns on it, and then to regain control over their alleged victimization, to karate chop the, the, the doll that's dressed as a devil, or to dismember it, or these sort of things. Uh, all the while, this is in a milieu of the therapist reinforcing the child's anger by saying, I don't blame you for being angry. I would be angry, too, if he did these things to me. You're, in essence, planting feelings that one can see picked up in subsequent sessions that reasonable people would wonder would they be there at all had not the therapist uh, engaged in those techniques. This therapist conducted the interviews. In court, the judge ruled the interviewing was biased and all charges were dropped. Dr. Keeley, I wonder if we could ask you some questions. We're from BBC Television in London. We, want, we wondered if you had any uh, comment to make about your role in the alleged case of satanic abuse here in Miami. Can you explain why you used leading, in, leading questions during the interviews? She rejects claims that social workers had planted the ideas of satanic abuse and continues to use the same techniques at her expanding practice in South Miami. The American experience of satanic abuse shows that despite extensive investigation, the police have found no evidence to corroborate the allegations. And in some cases, even the interviewing techniques of social workers and therapists have been exposed as biased, leading and contributing directly to the stories of so-called survivors. With the wheels of this American satanic industry in motion since the mid-1980s, it seems that the same mistakes are now being made in Britain. In February last year, a team of 22 social workers and police officers was dispatched from the mainland to South Ronaldsey on the Orkney Islands. The community was ill-prepared for what followed. Next morning, as dawn broke through a biting wind, social workers accompanied by police officers called at the homes of four families. We thought that it was a, a neighbour farmer come for help with a carving. I opened the door expecting to find a friend down the road, instead of which the conservatory was filled with police and social workers. She handed me a piece of paper and said, she said, They've, we've come to remove the children. She said something about 
we've, we believe that your children have been involved with lewd and libidinous acts. We're Quakers, so we couldn't be aggressive towards them. And all the time I was trying to have, invite them to have a cup of tea and talk about it. I turned round when they said that they were going to wake the boys and ran upstairs to wake the boys first. They weren't allowed to take a teddy bear or pack a case or take a toothbrush. And all the time it was rushing to get to take them away. He describes it as one of the worst, worst things that's ever happened when he woke up and found social workers looking down on him. Nine children were flown to the mainland that morning. Rumours of satanic rituals at this quarry were at the centre of the allegations. The children were interviewed over a period of five weeks, then returned home. One of the country's leading child psychologists is Val Meller. She assessed the interviews and says they were seriously flawed and justifiably criticised by the judicial inquiry. His Lordship, Lord, Lord Clyde, uh, has made 194 recommendations, many of which are to do uh, with the interviewing and the approach to the interviewing. Um, I think that probably says it. Uh, in my experience, they're, they're some of the poorest I've seen. Panorama has been prevented from broadcasting audio cassette recordings of interviews with the nine children from South Ronaldsey. However, we've obtained a cassette recording of an interview with a child who was taken into care just three months earlier. The social workers and police officer involved are deploying the same techniques as those used in the Orkney case. In the following extract, two social workers and a police officer are interviewing a six-year-old child. The interview begins with a social worker telling her what another child, during a separate interview, has already said. From the outset, the child has been fed information, and the interview is therefore contaminated. But even when the child protests, the interviewer refuses to accept her denials, thus giving the impression that she was not answering in the way they wanted. One of the big brothers is telling us that he stole put his sticky into your fanny. He did. 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 He did before continuing in a similar vein. Similar techniques were used with the group of nine children. A parent of one of the children believes those conducting the interviews were convinced that satanic abuse had taken place and were not looking for the truth but to confirm their own beliefs. They're looking for theories, they're looking for this abuse and they're trying to make a story fit what they believe because they're evident, they're, they really believe that they are going to find something. They really believe these theories. And that is the danger. This is the power that, that's misused. How far do you accept that some social workers and some police officers may have a belief in the existence of satanic and ritual abuse, which they are setting out to prove? rather than the evidence itself which proves the existence of I think that there are uh, certain people uh, about whom that is so. Um, and so they're set on uh, trying to prove uh, their, their, their own beliefs about what is happening. When that happens, it then becomes very difficult to have an open mind to all the evidence. Orkney is not an isolated example of poor interviewing techniques. 
1990, a large council estate in Rochdale. A similar outbreak of satanic abuse allegations. Again, dawn raids. This time, 17 children are taken from their homes. Panorama has obtained this video cassette recording of an interview with a six-year-old child. In the following extract, the social worker confuses a ghost for a satanic cult member. She begins by asking the child what clothes the ghost was wearing. This child is clearly describing fantasy. The ghost gets up and flies away. Yet the social worker was convinced that she had uncovered a victim of satanic abuse. None of the allegations in the Rochdale case were substantiated. In March 1991, Mr Justice Brown gave his considered judgment as to how allegations of satanic abuse had arisen in Rochdale. In his view, the interviews were seriously flawed. Obvious fantasy, he said, was accepted without question. And the social workers were obsessed with their own beliefs. Stories about satanic abuse found their way to Rochdale via a collection of articles by American specialists, which Panorama has obtained. The material was presented in court as clear evidence of how social workers in the Northwest had studied and circulated American propaganda. In one paper, symptoms of satanic abuse are listed. Fear of ghosts and monsters is described as a clear sign of abuse. Professor Elizabeth Newson, an expert witness in the case, is convinced American propaganda played a major role in the launching of a full-scale satanic abuse investigation. I think these articles were of a different kind in that they were fairly horrific in terms of sensationalism on the, on the one hand and then alongside that there was this rather spurious scientific thing about well here's a list of indicators and if you find this and this and this then you've probably got uh, sexual, not only sexual abuse but satanic abuse. Um, and that made people feel confident in looking for it. Uh, and I think there is a little bit of this feeling, well, you know, I wasn't in at the, um, the, the pioneering days of finding sexual abuse, but I'm going to be in on this one. There's that little bit of a feeling of, gosh, you know, this is, ex this is a bit exciting. I got quite worried about that feeling of excitement. Almost 60 cases of alleged satanic abuse of children have been investigated in Britain since 1988. Although some have reached the courts, there hasn't been one successful prosecution. The fault seems the same in every case. How far do you accept that erroneous interviewing and disclosure techniques have accompanied almost every allegation of satanic and ritual abuse? That would accord with my experience that um, uh, that uh, almost all investigation of ritual or satanic abuse has involved um, uh, some serious problems in, in interviewing. 
as in the United States, the church has been leading the pursuit of satanic abuse. There are some in both the established and non-conformist denominations who are already chasing Satan with missionary zeal. I certainly think that some people are motivated by a religious connection. Uh, I don't think it is always a crusade in religious terms. There is a professional type of crusade. But certainly some of the participants in these various cases have uh, been motivated partly in a religious way. From the contacts we have... One of those involved in spreading belief in satanic abuse is Maureen Davis, seen here starring in an American video. Based in North Wales, she's established a charitable trust called the Beacon Foundation to challenge and educate the church and public about the problems of the occult. She admits to frequently visiting the United States, gaining support and training for her work in Britain. Here, she regularly advises police constabularies and social services departments throughout the country. The allegations are now being undermined by the legal establishment. Judges are saying that the interviews have been appalling in many of these cases. Case after case has collapsed. Can you really continue to believe in the existence of ritual and satanic abuse if after all of that has happened? Yes, because when you see the survivors and the trauma that they have gone through, when you see somebody uh, wanting to leave a satanic cult, the fear that is imposed on them because of what they're leaving behind, the uh, kind of behaviour that they have, and the team effort that is needed to actually care for the individual. I have to say there's something here. But the police say there is no evidence here. The allegations themselves are now being undermined because of the way interviews have been conducted. Isn't it really a myth? I wish it was. But you have no evidence to suggest that it isn't a myth, do you? Well, I, all I can say is when there are adult survivors who have walked out of the groups and are sharing how, how difficult it is to leave the group with the fears that they have, then they, I have to say there is something here. But are you not prepared to accept that in many cases, these people may be suffering from other forms of psychological disorder, which has nothing whatsoever to do with organized ritual and satanic abuse. And should you be spending your time and money encouraging agencies in this country to construct what some people would argue is a myth? I, I... I have to say again, I work with teams um, and I work mainly with people who walk out. So um, I don't work with people under 16. It's, uh, um, no, I, 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 I cannot deny what I have heard. I, I cannot deny what I have seen. Uh, it needs a lot more people to uh, get together to be able to say, look, eventually that this will be cracked. So we should simply believe that it exists, even though there is no evidence to prove it. Do you think that's the right way to proceed? Um, is it the right way? All I can say is that I have seen the stress and the trauma that this, this problem causes, and I cannot deny it. For those who believe in the existence of satanic abuse, there seems little that will force them to rethink. And if those who believe continue to preach, it seems inevitable more cases will arise. But the cost is clear. Families will be broken up, children wrongly taken from their homes, and genuine cases of abuse may fail to get the attention they deserve. Ultimately, the system designed to protect our children may well end up abusing them.
Next week, Panorama will report on the topic originally scheduled for tonight, the proposed privatisation of British Rail's passenger services. That's at the usual time next Monday, half past nine.